to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ in the early days of mankind, God said, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Welcome to our study of the truth about marriage. Marriage is indeed a very serious and important topic, especially as we look across the state of marriages in the United States of America today where many marriages are ending in divorce, and where many people are choosing not to marry, opting not to have to deal with divorce and the heartache that goes along with that. And so we're excited today to be thinking about what God has to say that will help and be profitable to every marriage that's willing to follow God's Word. The Gospel of Christ, of course, is being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ and Christians worldwide. We're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. If you'd like to have a copy of this lesson or any of our lessons, you can go to our website, thegospelofchrist.com, where we have a host of Bible study material, as well as you can request certain CDs or DVDs that you may be interested in. And if you've got a Bible study question, a subject maybe you've been looking for a Bible answer on or like to study more about, we'd love to help you in your study of God's Word with that. And as always, we encourage you in your local area to visit the Church of Christ where you will find people who love the Word of God and have a sincere love for souls. As we think today about the subject of marriage, what an important topic. What an important topic indeed this is and how marriages need to put God at the center to really succeed. And so we want to begin by asking, what can couples do? What can married couples do to make their marriage really one that will glorify God? First, we suggest from the Scriptures that for marriage to be what God wants it to be, you have to understand the purpose of marriage. What's marriage all about? Why did God create marriage for His kind, for His creation, mankind? Well, marriage is to provide needed companionship. No one wants to be alone. When God created Adam, and then God created all the animals, all the other things in the days of creation. God saw that it was not good for man to be alone. He made a helper comparable to him. What's marriage about? It gives us needed companionship. God knew Adam needed. And God knows that man and woman need each other. They need the strength. They need to lean on one another. They need to not face life as a loner, but rather to have the companionship, the help, and the strength to be heirs of life. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, together. And so it gives needed companionship that God knew I've been made with, and so have you. Secondly, marriage is designed to propagate the human race. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. God said, let us make man in our image. Thus God made man in the image of himself, and he told man to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And so when God created man, he created him with a desire, with a need to fill the earth, to reproduce and to propagate the human race. And so when we think about marriage, that is the proper scope for sexual relations and reproduction. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, 4, Marriage is honorable and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. We then think about another purpose of marriage that I believe is 
often left out and it really ought to be right up at the top of the list with other purposes to marriage as well. For example, God created marriage and He created man and woman to be a helpmate, to be a helper. Genesis 2.18, Lord God saw that it was not good for man to be alone. He made a helper, made him a helper comparable to him. While we help one another in various levels, don't miss the fact that God created man and woman to help one another get to heaven. Friend, God created the marriage arrangement and God created man and woman to complement and to help one another. And so as we think about the purposes of marriage and that being to truly strive, to, 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 to struggle, to do what we can to help each other get to heaven, let's realize if that's the case, We need to be asking ourselves some very serious questions about those who we may be considering for marriage. I want to know, is the person whom I am considering, is the person you're considering, ask yourself, are they someone that will help me get to heaven? Are they someone who will encourage me in my spiritual walk? Will they help me to be a better student of the Bible? Will they help me to pray more? Will they help me to draw near to God? When we bring children into this uh, marriage arrangement, will they do everything possible to help them learn about God and become Christians and, and go to heaven? And so right at the top of the list, I'm looking for someone. God wants someone who will help me get to heaven, a helper in that daily walk with Christ to help me face the challenges, enjoy the good times, and be there to lean upon during the difficult. Then the Bible also teaches that as part of the joy of marriage, we have the privilege of the sexual relation, which is designed to prevent immorality. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 1 through 5, it is better to marry than to burn. You've got passions, I have passions, we all have desires that we were innately built with by God and in and of themselves and in the right scope. Those are things that are pure and right and holy. But where is that? area that's approved by God. Again, it's marriage. The bed is undefiled. Hebrews 13, verse number 4. And so marriage, part of it is to enjoy that relationship, to fulfill those desires, and it is the right and holy place that God has helped us to do that in, told us how to fulfill that desire. Now, friend, as we think about the purpose of marriage, let's also realize it is to help one another develop spiritually. 1 Peter 3, verse 7, and we mentioned this to an extent in that we're to help one another get to heaven, but our goal ought to be to help each other develop, grow, and mature spiritually. Ephesians 5, verses 21 through 31, you've got husbands who are to be head of the homes. You've got the wife who is seen as the queen of the home. She's to be in submission to the husband. Husband is to be the spiritual leader in the home, to think not of himself first, but to think of others and their spiritual growth and development. 1 Peter 3, verse 7, we're to be joint heirs of the grace of God together. I want to help my wife. I want my wife to help me to grow spiritually, to know the Lord better, to to, to develop a spiritual mindset, to not think about things of this world, but to truly think on the things of God and focus on what He wants me to do in this life. My friend, if we're going to succeed in marriage, not only must we come to the Bible and let it tell us what the purposes of marriage are, we've got to let God and the Bible be the standard in our marriages. Why do so many marriages break up? What causes people to lose focus, lose interest, not really have the kind of marriage that they ought to? One of the key reasons is we don't let God and the Bible have first place in our marriage like they ought to. Friend, the Bible clearly teaches God should be the foundation of every marriage. Psalm 127 verse 1 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. The psalmist said in Psalm 34 verse 3, Let us exalt His name together. That's the idea. God's got to be at the center. We've got to strive together in marriage to put God first. Now, listen carefully. When we talk about God and the Bible 
being our main priority and being the center of marriage, holding it together. That, mean he, that means He has to come before our own wants and desires. That means God has to be more important than money, more important than worldliness, more important than our jobs, more important than recreation in every decision and action I make. I need to put God at the forefront. Let Him be the guide in my marriage and His Word be the standard that we follow. Husbands and wives ought to make it their goal in life to help each other be more godly, to strive to improve their knowledge of God's Word, to study together, to pray together, to when decisions are going to be made in the home, when critical decisions are going to be made in the home. We need to let God's Word have free reign in our marriages. We need to ask, what does the Bible say on this subject? Is there any word from the Lord that will relate to this that we're dealing with? in our marriage. Jeremiah 37, verse 17. What does the Scripture say is the question we want to ask. Romans 4, verse 3. You want to study the Bible together in marriage. The Bible says, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And who better to study the word of God with than the one you've chosen, the one that's been selected to help you get to heaven. Husbands and wives need to pray together and pray for each other. James 5 verse 16 says, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man overcomes much. Men ought always to pray. 1 Timothy 2 verse 8, I want to pray that I'll be a better husband, a better father, that my wife will be an encouragement to us, that we'll all strive together to really have a home that will glorify and honor God and, and to bring prayer into that equation. What power and strength that brings. We can come boldly to the throne of grace that we might find grace and mercy to help in time of need. Now friend, here's a principle that relates to letting God and the Bible be the standard in marriage that we don't want you to miss out on. If God's going to be first and if His Word is going to be the standard, then a practical application is this. I have to put God before anybody else in my family. That means God has to come before my spouse, God has to come before my children and my family. It doesn't have to be that way, but if we're working together, God ought to be right there with them. But when things aren't like they ought to, maybe someone has a, a Christian, non-Christian relationship, or maybe people are not following the Word of God in the home like they ought to. How do I look at that? God's got to come first. Matthew 10, verse 37, Jesus said, He who does not love father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. When we talk about God in the home, let's also realize that for marriages and homes to be what God wants them to, the standard for living in the home has got to be God's Word. I love the words of Joshua 24 verse 15. Joshua said, yeah, you've got these idols over in the land of Ammon. You've got uh, these idols that you've been following. He said, you can do what you want to do. But I hope you'll do this in essence, he says. But here's the thing that we draw out of that. Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What kind of principles did Joshua teach in our homes? God and His Word must be the standard of living. God sets the tone on our lifestyle. God sets the tone for our morality. His Word is the guide that we follow. And when we have questions, whether they be moral, whether they be questions about the home or disciplinary action, whatever it may be, I want to let the Word of God be the standard that we follow. In matters related to the home, those matters must be decided by this book. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse number 17, that, that God's Word is that source that we look to. Jeremiah 37, 17 as well. Is there any word from the Lord? That's what we want to ask. What does this book say? 
on the subject, the matter that we're dealing with in the home. Uh, John 2 verse 5, we want to ask the question or, or remember the statement that Mary made. Mary, as she is giving instructions to some of the servants, she turns to them and says, whatever He, Jesus, says to you, do it. Friend, can you find better advice than that? Whatever Jesus says to us, we want to do it. And so, as it relates to matters of the home, let's let God's Word make the final decision. As Christian mates, we've got to help one another live up to God and His standard. As parents, we want to make sure that children do what is right according to the Bible. As the Scripture says, you want to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord so that they can know God and know His way and so that I give them the chance to know more about Christ and His living. As we think then, about how to make our marriages a real success. Friend, for that to work, for marriage to work, you've got to be committed to one another. You've got to be committed to each other. Uh, here are some of those commitments you've got to make. You've got to be committed, first of all, to leaving father and mother. I'm not talking about that you can't have relationships or you know have family. That's not what we're saying. But now, my main focus and interest it's me and my wife. It's our family. Listen to Genesis 2.24. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. There is the leaving of the old family unit that you were a part of. You were under father and mother. You leave that. You're joined to your wife. And now the new arrangement, the new family unit is made. And we're not going to follow the same decisions. We might if they're following the Bible. But their rules, their guidelines in the home are not going to dictate what we do in our home. We're going to let God and His Word and our family make those decisions. Will many of those be the same? Yes, if they're guided by the Word of God, they absolutely will. But we're not going to lean on parents to make those decisions for us. You know, this is a problem that occurs in marriage, whether it be husband, whether it be wife. You've got somebody who when matters may come up, troubles may arise, we've got to turn to mom and dad. They may give some advice, but let's turn first to the Bible. Let's build our own family unit based off the Word of God and God's teaching and have that leaving father and mother and cleaving to one another to build that wonderful relationship God wants. And so there's got to be that commitment to leaving father and mother. There has to be a true commitment to the permanency of marriage. Today, marriage is sadly are often cast off like garments that one loses interest in and changed as though it's a, just a suit of clothes. That, that's sad. That's not the way God designed marriage. The Bible teaches, Jesus spoke clearly, what God has joined together. Let not man put asunder. Matthew 19, verse 9. God hates divorce. Malachi 2, verse number 16. And so when we talk about marriage, you know, sometimes we hear, and maybe we don't hear it as much, often at a ceremony they will say, till death do us part. You know, that's biblical. Romans 7, verses 1 through 4, marriage ought to be until death. That's God's design. And thus, if, if my marriage is going to succeed, when I enter into that arrangement, I've got to say to myself, this is a commitment that no matter what, I make into life. Come good time, come bad time, come difficulty. If, um, if I have a lot or I have a little, I'm going to make it work. I'm going to overcome the struggles. And if you have the mentality that we're going to do everything possible within our power to make this work, bring your head and shoulders above many in our world who when hard times come, just throw in the towel. Along those same lines, you also have to be committed to facing the problems of life together. That's what marriage is about. God saw that it was not good for man to be alone. As we have problems and difficulties, we're there for each other. We want to help one another. We want to work together. We don't, you don't have to be alone in this anymore. That's the beauty and the harmony of marriage is I have somebody. And so do you if you're married to help you in this life. 
And then, of course, part of the commitment of marriage is you've got to be committed to provide for one another. If a man won't provide for his own, the Bible says he's worse than an infidel or an unbeliever. The man provided, and in Proverbs 31, you also have the virtuous woman who also did her share in the home and elsewhere as well. And so part of the commitment is to take care of physically, financially, emotionally, spiritually. That is a commitment you have to make. But you know, the key to marriage is it has to really be bound by true love. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13, Now abide faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. Ephesians 5, verses 21 through 31, Husbands are to love their wives as themselves. No one ever hated or abused himself. That's the idea. No one in his right mind harms himself. He loves himself. He's going to take care of himself. You're to love your wife and your family in that extent. The Song of Solomon, which is a beautiful love story, shows us the, the bond of love. Love is to be stronger than death. It's fire, flames, most vehement flames that many waters cannot quench. The, song, the, the writer of Song said, if a man were to give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. Song chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. And so let love be the binding agent that brings you together. Now listen carefully. We're not talking about lust when we say the word love. We're not talking about sexual attraction. We're not talking about desire. Those things may have their proper place, but they're not love. True love thinks about others first. True love is self-sacrificing. True love wants to make others happy, take care of them, wants to see them get to heaven. And while the relationship physically may exist inside that, compared to all the other things related to love. It is indeed a small part of the equation. Now, as we think about marriage, let's also listen to what God has to say concerning the subject of divorce and remarriage. Friend, when God instilled the home in Genesis 2.24, God meant for there to be one man and one woman for life. God said, for this reason, man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two become one flesh. That's the ideal. That's God's original plan. One man, one woman for life, staying in that relationship until death does them part. Romans 7, 1 through 4. God, God never wanted divorce to occur. He never wanted multiple marriages and remarriages and divorce. That's not a part of God's original plan. One man, one woman for life is God's original plan that He formed. Now, as we know, the Scriptures teach God Himself hates divorce. It, it fills one's garments with violence, the Bible says in Malachi chapter 2, verse number 16. Does Jesus say anything in the New Testament on the subject of divorce. He absolutely does. And I want to direct your attention to the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 19. And I want you to notice what the Lord says in Matthew chapter 19. Look beginning in verse number 3. The Pharisees also came to Jesus, testing Him and saying to Him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? He answered and said to them, Have you not read that He who made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and put her away? Jesus said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for fornication, sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery, and whoever marries her is divorced, commits adultery. What did Jesus say on the subject of divorce? It's not according to God's original plan. When God brings people together, He wants them to stay together, even though because of the hard-heartedness of the Israelites, God permitted it. 
It was never a command. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for fornication, and marries another, commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery as well. Jesus taught that in Mark 10, Matthew 5, 31 and 32, Matthew 19, 1 through 9. And so what's Jesus' words on divorce? Keep it together. Make it work. The only scriptural reason for divorce is fornication, sexual immorality. The Greek word pornea, illicit sexual activity outside of the marriage bond. And then and only then does the innocent party have a right to remarry. God has not given 101 reasons for divorce, for marriage, divorce, and remarriage. God hasn't done that. He's only given one reason for scriptural divorce, and then the only the innocent party can remarry. Now, as we think, though, about the subject of marriage, let's realize, though, God wants our marriages to be a success. Friend, God wants His children to go to heaven. He created the, the home and the family and marriage so that everyone inside that arrangement could prosper, could grow spiritually, could develop into children of God, and ultimately could get to heaven. And so as we think about marriage and the home and the family, let's ask some serious questions. Are we really doing our part to make sure that our marriages are following the Word of God? Is God really the center of my marriage? Every decision I make, every action I take, everything that I do, am I putting God and His will first? And am I doing my part inside the marriage relationship to make sure that I am a good helper? that I am striving to help my family and my children get to heaven as God wants me to. Friend, the greatest decision that one can make is to enter into that relationship with Jesus Christ. If you've never become a Christian, as always, God wants you to become a child of His. If you've heard the Word, you believe in Jesus, you're willing to repent of your sins, confess His name before men and be immersed, you can become a Christian today. And may God help us to make our marriages that which glorifies Him. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is taking the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we do and say. And unlike many other religious groups, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. This is the Gospel of Christ. And to God be we encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.